Well, anybody got a question this morning that they wanted to bring up? No, no hands are up. Anybody? Going once? Our younger contingent isn't here. They're at the college this weekend, so. Ken. 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 Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I was kind of wondering how to handle how you handle or how we should handle things when people attack us personally. I know you've been through that a lot. And I kind of think about that. And I, I think about how I struggle with it when someone, you know, and I know you've dealt with it time and time again, and you're still dealing with it. You know, give me some good recommendations on that. All right. Well, you know, if, if you're doing, doing anything positive, you can be sure <laughs> that uh, somebody's not liking it. I mean, cross, there's something inside the fleshly side of man that despises excellence in others. And, you know, uh, let's, let's take a look at Saul of Tarsus here. A little bit. We want to go to Acts chapter 9 for just a quick second. Acts chapter 9, you know, he's uh, been immersed. You know, he, he turned to the Lord. And uh, so... <clears throat> Okay, is, is this real? Okay, in other words, Saul of Tarsus had this <clears throat> tremendous record, an obvious record, of persecuting Christians, okay? Um, slaughtering them, the scripture says, putting them to death, executing them. And, uh, but he turned to the Lord, okay? And, in, um, and I don't want to get too much into what Mr. Luke might be preaching on, but uh, verse 27, uh, verse 26, uh, excuse me, Acts 9:26. When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. See, but Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he'd seen the Lord on the road, and he'd talked to him, and how Damascus he'd spoken out boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. And he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. You can see a little bit of resistance on, on people's part, because of Saul of Tarsus' past, all right? Now, he handled it. If you go to 1 Timothy, he doesn't have any guilt over this. 1 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 12. In other words, there's people who try to bring up your past. You know, I mean, I remember when I was working the smelter in Anaconda, one of the guys that was uh, that I worked with up there, <clears throat> you know, he'd been in the room next door where I was going to college in the college dormitory. See, and so I became a Christian, see, and so he's around there telling everybody, you know, who the J, real Jay Wilson, you know, is, you know, you know the college guy. <laughs> see, which, you know, that's not fair, but that's, uh, that's going to be typical because, you know, when a person, you know, turns to the Lord, the, the idea is, okay, let's, that stuff's all in the past. So Paul says in 1 Timothy 1.12, he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. And yet for this reason I found mercy, so in me as foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience and an example for those who believe in him for eternal life. So one of the key things is, you know, for the Christian, you know, that, I mean, what, what's in the past life is, is, it doesn't count. There's nothing, nothing on the record. Uh, you can actually talk about it and say, yep, this is that, but that guy died. You know, that guy, the waters of immersion took care of him. And there's a new guy, you know, came forth from the water. That's a really important point a lot of times. Now, <clears throat> the devil, of course, is not wanting to let anybody, you know, get free of the past. So 
you're going to have a percentage of uh, people that are going to try to throw your past back in your face and say, you can't, you know, you can't move ahead, you can't do this, you can't be that. And that's not the way the scripture looks at it. If that was the case, how would Saul of Tarsus become the great apostle Paul? See, he's able to put that behind, okay? That, that's a key factor here in that. Now, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, Second Corinthians 12, 20. Now, the church at Corinth, <clears throat> I mean, obviously had a lot of problems. I mean, there's no other congregation that got two letters. <laughs> okay, just try to, try to straighten them out, okay? I, I and uh, so you got stuff going on here. And uh, in verse 20, 2 Corinthians 12, 20, he says, For I am afraid that perhaps when I come, I might find you not to be what I wish, and may be found by you not to what, be what you wish, Perhaps there'll be strife, jealousy, angry tempers, disputes, slanders, gossip, arrogance, disturbances. I'm afraid when I come, my God may humiliate me before you. I may mourn over those who have sinned in the past, not repented of the impurity, immorality, and sensuality which they practice. So obviously the church at Corinth had a lot of issues. Uh, and that, you know they hadn't put the flesh to the death. Um, you know, in 1 Corinthians, Paul said that the fact that you're jealousy and strife among you, are you not acting like mere men? So, the, you know, you're always going to have a percentage of people that either really aren't focused on Christ or you're going to have a percentage of people that haven't grown in Christ to say nothing of the, of the world that's going to be attacking you and attacking your character, okay? And so, how do you handle it, Okay. Uh, take slander, for example. Slander is a, slander is a nasty one because you can never really trace it back to the source. You know, it's, it's out there. Uh, you know, it, it got out there. It got started. And, uh, you know, be very, very difficult to trace it. But there's going to be a lot of slander. That, that's just the way it is. And you, you as a Christian, you've got to understand that that's part of it. And the more visible you are, the more likely you're going to have that because you're a tar the more visible you are, there's more of you to be a target. Okay, that's, that's just the way it works, and that's all part of the, part of the landscape. Um, you know, gossip, you know, arrogance, disturbances. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, it said... Uh, well, in verse 8, he's, and Paul's getting on the guys at Corinth here because they're kind of arrogant. Um, you know, they're, you know, they're elevating themselves unduly. And uh, so in verse 8, he's, 1 Corinthians 4, 8, he's kind of snarky here a little bit. He said, you're already filled. You've already become rich. You became kings without us. Indeed, I wish that you had become kings so that we might reign with you. He said, I think God has existed as us apostles last of all as men condemned to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. See, so Paul's accepting the fact that as an apostle, he's going to take the brunt of a lot of uh, satanic attack. And uh, he said, we're fools for Christ's sake, but you're prudent in Christ." Uh, we're weak, but you're strong. You're distinguished. We're without honor. To this present hour, we're both hungry and thirsty, or poorly clothed, roughly treated, or homeless. We toil, work with our hands. When we revile, see, here's start to get the solution here. When we're reviled, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure. When we're slandered, we try to conciliate. We become as the scum of the world, the dregs of all things until now. So the idea is you don't become over overcome by evil, you overcome evil with good. And so if somebody's cussing you out, that's what reviling is, you know, you bless them. If uh, somebody's persecuting you, you, know, you endure it. Uh, if you're slandered, you try to conciliate if possible. Because, you know, these things do go on. And Paul said, you know, look, at we're the scum of the world, we're the dregs of all things until now. 
And so you can see how he's mentally handling that sort of thing. When, when it happens, you just take it positively. Um, if you try to defend yourself against slander or, or stuff like that, you, you can't do it. You know, the, you know, the best way to handle things like that is, uh, you know, just, just let the fire die out as much as it can. You know, just don't, don't keep putting logs on it. Because <laughs> uh, obviously if it's slander, it's, it's not true. And, but that's, you know, that's what happens is, is a lot of slander uh, goes on out there and you just have to accept it. Um, I know when I was, when we were at the, the building on Garfield Street, I was known in Bozeman as the Antichrist of Garfield Street, you know, from, you know, because of my encounters with the, with the preachers and stuff like that, you know, spreading all kinds of stuff that aren't true. You know, I even met with somebody, another congregation here recently and, and, uh, you know, tried to conciliate and, uh, you know, he just, he just flat told me, he said, well, they told me before I met with you to keep my head on a swivel. You know, in other words, you can't trust a thing that this guy's got to say. He's dangerous. He's, he's tricky. And, you know, the attempt in the whole uh, attempt to conciliate here, like Paul's talking about, you know, it, it went nowhere because the fact that the, the guy wasn't willing to, to even be objective or even try to have a rational discussion. You know, and that's that's all part of the landscape. Is when you're when you're a Christian, you know you're you know, you're involved in spiritual warfare. In Second uh, Timothy chapter two, Second Timothy chapter two, verse twenty-three. This happens a lot when you're having personal Bible studies, and uh, the person's feeling some heat. 2 Timothy 2.23, he says, But refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, know that they produce quarrels. That was the goal, produce a quarrel. Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, kind to all, able to teach, patient when wrong, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, they may come to their senses, escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. So one of the things you got to do is you got to learn to be positive, you know, kind, able to teach, patient when wrong, you know. People throw a lot of stuff in your face, you know, and uh, just, you, know, you just learn to have a calm attitude about it and uh, maintain a, a good positive focus. You know, you're, you're trying to reach in there and save a soul is what you're trying to do. And so you got to expect there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be said. When people are not right with God, they got a lot of internal stuff. See, that's really, really agitating them on the inside. And so a lot of times that's going to come out in, in a lot of different ways. So your goal is to try to help them get it right with God. Of course, and that's on God's terms, you know, not on theirs. Okay. So, you know, you know, hey, you know, you, we'll have a special deal here, God, that doesn't work that way. So with gentleness, see, correcting those in opposition. So you got to maintain a cool composure. You know, uh, you, know, I've, you know, I'm perfectly excited for other people to feel any way they want to about me, and I'm particularly excited when they feel confident enough in my presence to say so. See, see why, would I, why would I have that as a present positive affirmative? Because you come up against it so often, so often. See, so it's always a, a focus. You know, where do we, where do we get our value? And I think this is, I think this is a core in everything in Christianity. It's core for the young ladies, you know, desperately trying to find a husband. It, for young guys, desperately trying to find a wife. It's, you know, uh, across the board. See, where do you, where do you get your value? And in Jude, he, he opens up with just a, a picture here. Jude chapter 1. Jude 1 1. He says, Jude, 
a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. See, one of the things that the scripture does is it keeps letting us know this is who you are in Christ. This is who you are. Number one, you're part of the called. Now, you know that if you've been obedient to the gospel. The gospel's God's call. It's objective. You see, it's not subjective. You know, maybe at some point, I think I mentioned years ago, I wrote a bill, letter to Billy Graham. And I said, Billy, I, I understand this is what you think about the way of salvation, except in Jesus well, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association answered the letter, and uh, you know they said, "Well, it appears that you've assessed Mr. Graham's uh, uh, position correctly," and uh, and then close, uh, you know, you know, we appreciate the fact that you're a brother in Christ, and you know, keep up the good work. <laughs> uh, okay, that's bogus stuff. See, and so all the things that they try to teach people about how. Uh, you're, you're saved, you're blessed, you know, you're, that, that's all bogus because it's based on the false proposition, wrong direction. So our, our idea of being the called has to be based on what the scripture says, not how we feel about it. It's objective. And God's doing that for the very reasons we're talking about, so that we have the confidence facing whatever it is we need to face uh, going forward. The um, beloved and God the Father, okay? I mean, they emphasize over and over and over again, God loves you, okay? That was, those are words, uh, but do they, they reach into the inner soul? See, that's, that's the question, see? So if basically, if God loves me, I don't care what you guys think. You know, at some point, it's, it's got to come down to that. You know, if I know where I stand with God, no games, you know, no, no fake stuff, straight up honest, then, uh, then it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks because I, I guarantee you the world's coming after you. Um, and kept for Jesus Christ. You're kept. See, that's, uh, that's exciting to know that, yeah, he's, you know, we belong to him. The word Christian means one who belongs to Christ. So he regards us as his possession, and he's, he's watching out for us. He's working for us. So, uh, those are positive things that you use to handle all the stuff that's going to come your way. You know, I, I can pretty well count on it. At any given time, there's at least three or four people mad at me, you know, for whatever reason. And, uh, and you, know, I, you know, it doesn't, you know, it's not going to impact who I am. It's not going to impact my teaching or preaching. Um, I'm just going to keep moving forward and and it uh, doesn't matter whether it's here, or Great Falls, or Butte, or Helena, any places I'm preaching right now, it doesn't go matter. We got a message. You know, my motto is, I came, I saw, I delivered. You know, and that's God's perspective, really, for all of us. You know, we came, we saw, we delivered. Okay. Um, so, further thoughts, or anything on that, Ken? Anybody else want to comment? Okay. Another question today. We had the, I had the chance to ask you these questions separately at school here, but could you talk a little bit about Korah? We could see his sons giving us psalms and some, some of that, just kind of getting the yeah. whole picture together. Well, let's try to go to First Chronicles, see if we get an answer, okay? Because it looks like maybe that everybody in the uh, family of Korah was destroyed you know, when the earth opened up and swallowed them up, right? And, uh, but First Chronicles is kind of handy. Ezra, you can tell this is done by Ezra. Ezra did a lot of work to, uh, you know, he was a scribe, you know, skilled, it says, in, in the law of the Lord. And uh, so he's the one that really um, put all these, you know, he's the one that, uh, as near as we can tell, collected the Old Testament canon. And he's the one that went back through into these uh, um, genealogies and stuff like that. And so in First Chronicles chapter 6, I think is where we're going to find what we're looking for. Verse 1. 
for his talk about the priest. And um, that's the lands. Okay. Maybe I need to find the descendants. I got the lands here. What's that? 22? Oh, 6, 1, and 2. Oh, yeah. See, the sons of Kohath. Okay, we're looking for Korah, though, right? 22, yeah. I think that's the number that's stuck in my head. I just didn't see it. Sons of Kohath were Aminadab. Okay, that's you know, going to be the ancestor of Moses, right? Korah, his son. Okay, and then it's going to go through at some point. It's going to give you the descendants of Korah. Um, see, this is, this is going to be Samuel's genealogy here. This is, so, yeah, it's interesting. See, Samuel is going to be a descendant of Korah. See, so not all of them were destroyed when the earth opened up. And so that, that record keeps going. Don't know exactly the details on it, but this, this is the record here so that we have then the sons of Korah be going to be set aside by David to you know, be singers and, and minstrels, prophets, stuff like that. What's that? Yeah, um... Them. That, that, that may be a different Korah. Yeah. That's a lot of genealogy to wade through there. But, yeah. But it looks like, like I say, this is Korah's genealogy there in verses 22, some of it, you know, down, down to Samuel. See, in other words, obviously uh, Ezra is not going to give you every individual's Genealogy. He's picking out some of the key guys, and so there's there's uh, some of the descendants right there. For a thought. Possible, because it looks like twenty years and older is the yeah. level of responsibility. Yeah, it it that'd be a good assumption, although it doesn't I definitely say. Right yeah. There. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they but they did keep going. Good, good reading. <laughs> okay, other questions or comments here? I did. Recently when I was in Numbers, too, he says a little later in Numbers 26, 11, I couldn't remember, so I had to look it up. But the sons of Korah, however, did not die. Yeah. So he, so he even in Numbers, because otherwise it would be confusing without that in there, because you see him all over the place later. Yeah, yeah. So. I sort of remembered reading it, but I couldn't. Yeah. Couldn't place it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Number 2611, right? Yeah. Okay. Other questions today? A comment on that. Yeah. It, it is kind of interesting that it really does not matter where you came from in terms of your ancestry, whether it was Korah or Rahab, you know, God can use you as an individual. That's really a key point because, you know, going to 1 Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, 1 Timothy 1, 3, he says, uh, as I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to street teach strange doctrines, nor pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. The genealogies were important in the Old Testament. I think they did a good job in the movie is Genesis History, pointing out that they're really the, the skeleton uh, on which all the the history hangs, and so very important for a physical people, and 
also for Jesus to be able to prove his genealogy as long as the temple existed. Um, of course, once the new covenant come in, comes in, you know, what does your physical ancestry matter? It doesn't. See? Um, you know, in the book of Philemon, Philemon chapter 1, verse 10. Philemon 1.10, he says, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, who formerly was useless to you, but now is useful both to you and me. Okay? So Onesimus was a slave, okay? And uh, the word Onesimus means useful. And, uh, but he ran away. Uh, and kind of implication that uh, in the process of running away, maybe he broke some stuff on the way out. You know, people would tend to do that, right? But it's exciting because Onesimus went all the way from Colossae all the way across the Balkan Peninsula or however, uh, or all the way across uh, to, to clear to Rome. Had to cross the Balkans or by sea or however he got there. He got to Rome. Then he had to find out what prison Paul was in, in Rome. And he had to be able to track him down in prison. And um, so Paul taught him the gospel while Paul was in prison. And, uh, and he says, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I begotten in my imprisonment. So Onesimus was uh, immersed by, by Paul's teaching. Okay. And uh, so, okay, here's a slave. Now, I mean, how about that for an ancestral recommendation here, right? Um, but he says... Uh, I've sent him back, verse 12, I've sent him back to you in person, that is sending my very heart, whom I wish to keep with me, so that on your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment in the gospel. So without, but without your consent, I did not want to do anything, so that your goodness would not be in effect by compulsion, but of your own free will. For perhaps he was for this reason separated from you for a while, that you would have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, <coughs> Philemon, Especially to me, but how much more to you, since he's going to be physically present with you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Okay. So what does it matter, Philemon's ancestry or Onesimus' ancestry? It doesn't matter. See, what matters is that whether God's your father. It kind of ties in with what we were talking about a little bit earlier. Uh, so if God's your father, you've got spiritual DNA. And that trumps any earthly DNA, you know, by every event. So that's why the New Covenant is saying, look, it doesn't matter what your physical ancestry is. Why pay attention to endless genealogies? It doesn't matter. Um, so in Christ, there's neither slave nor free, right? doesn't matter. So you walk into the assembly and, you know, the slaveholder is going to be sitting down there and the slave going to be, an educated slave going to be doing a lot of the teaching that day. See, is that a problem? Can't be, can it? You know, I mean, some old slaves are well educated. Um, the guy that actually wrote this, the text for Romans at Paul's dictation was a slave named Tertius. That's, that's number three. See, there's a slave name. It doesn't, so it doesn't matter under the terms of the New Covenant. But you see, people still try to hang on to that. Um, you know, I was in Scotland, and I made sure that I got the, the Wilson family crest in Scotland, you know, um, because that physical ancestry is so important, you know, impacts so many things. You know, the, 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 I mean, even practiced my Scots brogue while I was there, right? Okay. <laughs> you know, and the... And the the motto is all packs, A-U-X, P-A-X, you know, and uh, A-X, A-U-X, Bellum, B-E-L-L-U-M. That means either in peace or in war. That means whatever, it's there. the Wilsons are there, right? That, that, does that matter? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter at all. See, what matters is that whether we're part of the family of Christ. 
See, so physical ancestry doesn't have anything to do with it. And again, you know, uh, the, the past. I mean, I, I, we work with people all the time who are coming out of the depths, you know, of darkness, you know. So, and, you know, we, we're excited when they grab a hold of it. And some of those people, you would know some of their past. Some of them are very intelligent, very intelligent, you know, fighting off some of the addictions. You know, a lot of times, my experience is people with addictions a lot of times are smart enough to recognize the earth is futile <clears throat> at a very young age. And, you know, they already <clears throat> figured out what took the philosophers centuries to figure out that it's pointless. And so, you know, a lot of times they're very intelligent. And uh, when they get it right, they do do a lot of really great things. You're going to hold that against them? No. Going to hold this against uh, Onesimus? You know, I mean, Paul's pretty plain here. Beloved brother. I mean, he's sticking that right in, in Philemon's face. See, for good reason. See, for good reason. Beloved brother. So that, that's where God's going with it. And uh, it's uh, pretty exciting to realize, you know, your, your value comes from Christ. You know, is God your father? Spiritually, is, is God your father spiritually? Nothing else matters. Anything else? Another comment? Question? I might uh, do a question if you're up for it. The, um, this last week I ended up watching a little clip on Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro. And Jordan Peterson was, I don't know when the... I don't know when this came transpired. I just saw it this week. Um, but Jordan Peterson was kind of trying to make a case in general for Christianity, even though the guy doesn't claim to be a Christian. Of course, Ben Shapiro, Jew. And I think the, there was a little bit of a conflict in Shapiro's mind because most Christians that he's debated, including John MacArthur that he mentioned, basically... Ben Shapiro is saying, as Jews, we got to do. Like, you got to follow all these commandments. And Jordan Peterson was basically saying, as Christians, you got to do. You got to follow Jesus. And Ben Shapiro is like, well, that, that's basically not what I get from everybody else. The difference is Jesus, and with, because of Jesus, you don't have to do. <laughs> and it made me think, obviously, we understand what it means to live by faith. But Beg the question, and I'm just giving you that for the background where I was coming from. If you got a chance to debate Ben Shapiro, you know, what, what are some things or, you know, some, somebody like that who's intellectual, conservative, Judeo-Christian values system, but from in terms of Christianity, what do you have a logical th in your process in your mind of what things would you target to be able to go for the logical kill in terms of Christian? It might be a big question. You can t do what you want with it, but. Yeah, well, that's, that's a great question. Probably gonna you know, happen on occasion. You know, I've had the opportunity to try to convert several Jews over the years and uh, modern Jews. Okay, you take a guy like Ben Shapiro or say Dennis Prager. Okay, they would say that the Old Testament is inspired, okay? Most of your modern Jews, you know, they, they're bas basically communists, okay, <laughs> left-wingers. Uh, they don't really think that the scripture, I think I mentioned, is it Hild Amy, Hilderman. Amy Hilderman, okay, used to be a neighbor up uh, Bracket Creek up there. And she, she wrote a book that Connie gave me. Uh, she's modern Jewish, uh, One God, Many Paths, right, okay. Well, you can't have a logical discussion with people like that. You know, they, they've already turned their brain off a long time ago and ran down the emotional road. But guys like uh, Shapiro, uh, okay, logical. He's going he's gonna to say the Old Testament is the Word of God. And I think I mentioned 600 or 713 commandments the other day. It's actually only 613 that you've got to keep, uh, of which about 50 deal with priests, okay. But, I mean, it's only, okay, so, you know, just round figures, 650, okay, 
or, or six, well, we'll just drop it, 550, okay? Only 550 commandments you gotta keep, right? Okay. <laughs> okay, see that, number one, okay. Um, so, a guy like Shapiro, I go straight for the jugular and I start talking about the prophecies of Jesus. See, that's the issue, really, is Jesus the Messiah? Okay, they, I mean, those guys know from the Old Testament the Messiah is coming. They know that. And if, so I, I would just go straight for those Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. You know, and like I say, in the process of becoming a Christian, I, I somehow have lost that Bible in, in, in the moves, but you know, I think uh, three moves equals one fire. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think that's the way that, that, that tallies up. But uh, I had a Bible. It was an old 1973 NASB. And I went through and I underlined every prophecy of Jesus uh, and every prophecy of Jesus' kingdom in the Old Testament. You know, it was part of my process of becoming a Christian and establishing my faith that the scriptures were to God. And my, by my count, there's about 750. Now, you, you know, a different way. When I count Isaiah 52, I count about 20, 20 plus prophecies of Jesus right in Isaiah 53. Some people might count that as one prophecy or however you look at it. But that's a lot of prophecies. So what are you going to do with that? You know? Uh, I have in my library a Jewish Tanakh, you know, published by the, the Jewish Bible Society. And, uh, you know, it starts at the back end, and it's in English, and it goes toward the front. And uh, every one of those prophecies, they take this maximum amount of liberty with the language they can to push that away from Jesus. Okay? Let me give you an example. Isaiah chapter 7. And the liberal, liberal uh, so-called Christians do the same thing. <clears throat> Isaiah 7, 14. Isaiah 7, 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. See, behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she'll call his name Emmanuel. Okay? Now, again, I'm no Hebrew scholar, you know, and... I can kind of figure out a Hebrew letter, but I can read the English behind the Hebrew letters. Okay, and that word translated virgin there is the Hebrew word Alma, okay? So what both the, you know, the Jewish Bible and the, um, say the Revised Standard Version do is they translate that young woman Okay. Now, this is a big sign that a young woman's going to give birth to a child, right? It never happens. <laughs> right? Okay. See, now, see, implicit in Jewish society, a young woman was a virgin. See, so it says, it is young woman, but it means a virgin young woman. See, so they're, they're taking this part of it here. And like I say, the liberal scholars, you know, supposedly Christians do the same thing. See, they're trying to bend it away uh, from what it actually says, okay? So they do that with all the prophecies. You know, I went through, I didn't look at all of them. I looked at probably about 20 of them. I just bend them, just push the language as far as possible. Now, what that does, if a person did it once or twice, okay. Uh, but when it happens every single prophecy, see, that tells you they know those prophecies are pointing to Jesus. And they're trying to push the audience away from it. See, I'm not being honest, in other words. So that's what I would do. I'd, I'd go right for the jugular, say, all right, we're going to talk about Jesus. Because anything about Christianity is going to be tied to whether Jesus is really the Messiah, whether he's the fulfillment of those Old Testament prophecies or not. See? And so you know where that's going to lead. 
okay, it's going to lead to the, all are the New Testament manuscripts authentic? See, are the testimonies true? The same question that you'd have trying to discuss it with the liberal unbeliever. Same, same exact process. So the result is that biological processes, you're going to be able to nail a guy like Shapiro down. But, I, you know, you, the key thing would, of course, be to focus on Jesus. Okay? Why would you be trying to focus on whether Christians do this or that? It's, it's irrelevant if Jesus isn't who the Bible says he is. So you focus on Jesus. And, but that's one of the devil's favorite tricks is to get it off of Jesus and to get it onto people. Yeah. Yeah. Other comments, Mr. Luke Wilson? Yeah, that's great. Um, to be fair to Ben Shapiro, he was saying it seems the difference is Jesus. <laughs> he said so what? He, to be fair to him, he said it seems the difference is Jesus. Oh, yeah. So yeah, there exactly. you go. Um, so, yeah, I appreciate that. That, that, is, that makes perfect sense of the way to do it. Now, a follow-up side question in my mind is from a Jewish perspective, if you have not recognized who Jesus is, how do they deal with the issue of sin in their current do they have, do they try to just push off the need for a savior and just whatever this Jewish God is, if you do your best and try hard to keep the commandments, then you're going to get there? I, I'm just curious yeah. if they have a savior or recognize their need for that. Yeah. Well, see, again, that's a great question. And um, turn to Mark chapter 7. See, from the time of the Babylonian captivity onward, they were in the process of something, uh, developing something called the Talmud, okay? The Talmud's really a library. Uh, it's a collection of rabbinical writings, all right? And um, so the issue here in Mark 7, 1 and 2, it says, the Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him when they'd, they'd come from Jerusalem and had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands, that is, unwashed. You recall at the wedding feast there in John chapter 2, there's these six stone water pots, got about 20, 30 gallons each in them. Because there's a Jewish custom, you know, that you had to dip your hands in, you know, let the water drip off the elbows, which I'm going to sure that's going to be clean. And, uh, and you know, you'll be ritually cleansed in that process, okay? And that's not in the scripture. It's something that they, they made up. You see, in verse 3, it says, For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. See, and when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. There are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. Okay, in other words, they had all these traditions. See, that's why the scripture is going to sometime talk about the law and the customs. Okay? And uh, so this is something they received. And, and so in verse 5, the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with their bread with impure hands? And of course, he quotes the prophecy of Isaiah about these guys are far away from God. Verse 9 Verse 8, he says, neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. He's also saying, you're experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. I mean, that's a pretty, <laughs> pretty in your face. See, so what they're doing is they're going to use the Talmud rather than the scripture. They're gonna, this is the collection of the rabbinical writings. And, in other words, the traditions that have been handed down through the years, okay? So... The, it's, they, they skip the scripture and they move right to tradition in order to get any feeling of absolvement whatsoever. And so uh, the first uh, trip we did to uh, Minsk in 1994, uh, we we're in a Boeing 747 and going, crossing the Atlantic, going from Chicago to uh, Zurich, Switzerland. And there was this modern Jewish guy sitting in the front row. And, uh, you know, he kind of had his special black hat and everything on. And then 
you know, as soon as the sun rose through the windows, you know, he had his, you know, stuff set up there on the counter in front. He's on the front row. See, and then he's doing his, you know, thing like this. And, you know, and, uh, you know, yeah. You know, had, had his morning ritual that he was going through. See, so the idea is, is in those in those rituals, there's absolution or purification. See, it's not nothing to do with if, with anything. They just see he got that set up to where the people actually believe. But by, by doing now, obviously, he's an Orthodox type of Jew. You know, the eighty uh, percent of Jews or modern Jews are either atheist or agnostic. See, so most of those guys aren't even going to bother, but the, the guys that have any sort of traditional Jewish, they're going to do stuff like that to, so once you've gone through your, your ritual, see, you, you know, the idea is, well, you feel purified because you did your morning ablutions, your morning ritual, and uh, ready to go. That's out of the Talmud. Not out of the scriptures at all, but that's how they handle it. Remember, we've talked about how you know, the, the rabbis today, they will teach you that if you come to the synagogue, okay, and they've done a switcheroo, they call that temple. Say I, you know, I catch the, you know, weather channel early in the morning to figure out what vehicle I'm going to need to go to Great Falls. Like today, I've got my biggest all-wheel drive with the gnarliest tires I got. You know, to <laughs> run that trip. The uh, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, if you want to tow Elena, you know, just, just hook on behind and we'll get there, right? Uh, <clears throat> but uh, you know, so one of the ladies there, name is Stephanie Abrams. What does that tell you? She's Jewish, right? And, uh, you know, so she'll talk about the weather. If anybody's going to temple this morning, uh, it's not the temple. See, that thing was destroyed, wasn't it? That was, that was the destruction of the temple was one of God's signals that the Jewish system dead. See? So where are the sacrifices? Where are the priesthood? Where's anything in the Old Testament that's going to grant anybody any spiritual relief whatsoever? Gone. It's not in there. So they have to start making up these synagogue uh, t things, you know, temple. They also will talk about worshiping in the synagogue on the Sabbath. Yep. Which, that's not, that's not the case either, see? But they're, they've come up with a fake system based on tradition, and they sell it. And uh, so, you know, feel good about yourself because you've been following the traditions. I think I mentioned, uh, you know, somebody, a Jewish guy I was at studying with a Jewish couple, they asked me to read James Mitchner's book, The Source, <clears throat> you know, to help me understand where they're at. And the source is about that thick. It's easier to read the Bible. You know. <laughs> but... It's a history of Israel, and you know a lot of it's really accurate. But the purpose of that book, see, I, I suspect Michener's Jewish, myself. I mean, I, I would almost, you know, I, you know, if I was a betting man, I'd be willing to put a lot down on that. But it's a defense of modern Jewish atheism following the traditions. That's what it is. It's a defense of following this system without any basis for it. So again, if you're working with uh, Jews, you know, you're trying to help them process, you know, reality. Okay. Again, the big issue in any direction you go is that people have bought a system of thought. You know, the evolutionists have bought a system of thought. Um, you know, uh, the Baptists have bought a system of thought. The modern Jews bought a system of thought. Trying to break that down by logic, boy, you got too many, a lot of emotional barriers there. Charlie? Well, it sounds like the, the Talmud is, is just like the uh, Book of Mormon. People just mm -hmm. 
doing whatever they want and not really even looking at scripture. So uh, when you bring up scripture to like the Jews, they just deny everything, but yet uh, they said it is inspired. So, you know, it's inspired whatever they want, I guess. Yeah. Well, it's like old pass authority, right? You know, where they get that, you know? Or the Catholic Church has authority, or the Catholic Church, same exact type of thinking, you know? You said something about they sell it. <clears throat> Our plants, Safeway's plants, uh, to produce product, particularly bread plant, um, to get the label that they want on it, the K or the Parve, or I've forgotten ex all of it. <clears throat> Once a year, they would come into our plant. <clears throat> he would light a propane torch, mm -hmm. wave it around, and for a certain amount of money, for a whole year, all of our product was blessed by the, mm -hmm. the rabbinical priest there. Oh, so. yep. Kosher, it was kosher. That's, kosher, that's yeah, the word yeah. I was looking for. Yeah, yeah for, I, I don't know what the fee was, but it was thousands of dollars. Yeah. No. Money well, m money well spent. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, like sometimes in, in Butte we run out of homemade uh, bread, you know, and so we'll beat it down to Safeway and, you know, go to the Jewish yeah. section and, Dr. and Dr. you know, Dr. get Dr. some uh, crackers and, and uh, well, not crackers, they're unleavened, and they, but they've been blessed by the rabbi, so. <laughs> for fee. For fee, for kosher, yep. You said something that sparked a question in my mind. You said that they're basically atheists following the Judeo system, but they would agree that the Old Testament is inspired. Well, if they're atheists, then who inspired it? Yeah. See, I mean, that's a great question. I don't know if you guys remember or you had a chance to. We were watching the patterns of evidence, and they had the uh, rabbi from the largest Jewish synagogue in America on. And so, you know, he was being questioned by uh, Mahoney uh, about that. And he says, well, <clears throat> you know, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter whether the Moses account in Exodus is true. It doesn't matter. See, in other words, truth is no issue. It's just this is how we're going to do things. See, and that's... You see, obviously, there's a a, a devil-driven disconnect in there. Uh, you know, there's a there's a wedge that's been driven between the two halves of the brain because they're holding two contradictory thoughts. See, and to you and me, that hey, you you better get that reconciled. You know, you're going to go nuts if you try to do that. And that's why there's a lot of repression. You know, I mean, anybody that comes up against the scripture and refuses to go with it, then they start walling off sectors of their brain so they don't have to deal with certain things. And this, that's a classic example. Of it. I guess this is what doesn't make sense to me, though. Why would you want to follow that Jewish system if you're not doing it to please God? I mean, why be... If you're atheist, you don't believe there is a God. So why follow that system? Mm -hmm. Well, part of Katie's education, you know, she's had to suffer through a number of things since she got married to me. And part of her education was having to watch the movie Fiddler on the Roof. She had never seen Fiddler on the Roof, right? How many here have seen Fiddler on the Roof? Yeah. Okay. So at some point, what is it? Tradition, right? Tradition. It doesn't, doesn't matter. It's just tradition. It doesn't matter. See? And, and, and Catholic thought process is the same. It, it doesn't, it's just tradition. It doesn't matter what the truth is. And so you're always trying to get, you're trying to get, you know, the clutch plate here between the two halves of the brain to stick so that now you can get some traction when you're going through there so that people will actually think a little bit because long until that clutch plate, you know, it's just spinning in there going nowhere but that's that is the big problem universally in the human race whether it's jewish or catholic or baptist or pentecostal or evolutionist or liberal left-wing communist marxist you know it's all the same process nobody is making sure that the whole process is getting together in their brains because if they do there's going to be some sort of explosion 
and they're not going to like it. Further thoughts there, Nick? Let me get that. Sorry, it just further points out to me that there really is only one truth. Yeah, that's right. I am the way, Jesus said, and the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through me. So how do you get into Jesus Christ? Immersion into Jesus Christ. You know, I was working with a Jewish couple. Um, some of you may remember them years ago from the Garfield Street building. And uh, in, he was from Baltimore. He met his wife at one of the Pennsylvania, I don't know if it was Lehigh or one of those. Anyhow, they were doing graduate work in chemistry. He was doing graduate work in chemistry. And so taught him the gospel, immersed him, and then went back home for Christmas break. And, uh, you know, his, last, his name was Steve Shaftel, all right? And uh, so, you know, now he's meeting with his dad. Now, guess who's financing his college education? Dad. Okay, so dad says, you better back away from that Christian stuff or else, right? Okay, so he's got a problem. He'd like to be a Christian, but he's going to have to be one secretly. In order to be one secretly, he's got to repudiate his immersion, Right? Because the immersion is, you know, that's, you can be a secret disciple, you know, but as soon as you get immersed, immersion is part of the package. It's not a secret disciple. I mean, that's obviously coupled with the public confession, I believe, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, okay? But immersion is where you cross the line. And so he decided that immersion was not plan of, part of the plan of salvation. And so this young couple and a young lady that was, uh, had got emotionally tied up with them. And uh, so Romans chapter 6, because, again, I is the bad guy. And uh, Romans chapter 6, so we, we, we opened up the Bible, Romans chapter 6. And uh, we read verse 3, do you not know that all of us who've been immersed into Christ Jesus have been immersed into his death? So I said, Steve... Answer this question. How do you get into Jesus Christ? He says, well, you believe into Jesus. I said, well, you know, I wonder if you take a look here at what we just read. How do you get into Jesus Christ? He said, well, you repent. I said, well, what's this verse say? He says, well, you confess into Christ. I said, really? I said, what's it say, Steve? Because when you're dealing with people's eternities, you don't always get to be the nice guy. See, you're, you know, you're concerned about people going to heaven. That's, that's, that's why you're doing what you're doing, right? So what's it say, Steve? He sat there. He just sat there. He just sat there. So, I said, well, it's been nice knowing you. Now, you don't like to have to do that. I mean, I spent hours and hours with this young couple. See, when you're staying with somebody, you're actually laying your life down. No, you're not over there be because you didn't have anything to do that evening. You know, you're there because you care, okay? So when you have to fold up your Bible, say, well, we can't go any further. Been nice knowing you. Have a nice eternity. That's all you can do. So when people shut their brain down, you're done. 
one way or another, hit the point where words don't have meaning, you're done. Conversation's over. And that's how it is in the scripture over and over and over and over again with people who reject the gospel, right? It increasingly hardened against Jesus Christ, and uh, you can't reach them. That's why Paul, you know, he there in Antioch, he'd shake out his garments. <laughs> he said, you guys judge yourselves of unworthy of eternal life. He said, we're going to the Gentiles, and he shakes off the dust of his feet on the way out, right? Say, Paul, that's not very loving or very kind, right? Did Jesus tell him to do that? Yeah, he did. Matthew chapter 10. See, in other words, there's a driving issue with the scripture here uh, that people have to face. And uh, we don't want to put rubber tips on the sword of the Spirit. <clears throat>